Hi, this is Tammy McClish. Let's take a look at Section 9 Image Evaluation. Now there's a term that is called radiographic image quality. The term image quality refers to the fidelity with which the anatomical structure that is being imaged is rendered on the radiograph. A radiograph that faithfully reproduces structure and tissues is identified as a high quality radiograph. So when I'm working in an x-ray department, I have to determine if my problem with my image is due to the fact that something happened with the film or something happened with the geometric factors or something happened with the subject that I was x-raying. So these are some things I keep in the back of my mind when I'm looking at my image. And we've talked about quite a few of these in the past few sections that we've covered. So if I'm looking at film factors, I'm looking at density. Is the film too dark or too light? Is it too black or is it too white? We're looking at contrast. With contrast, we're looking at, is it too white and black or is it too gray? The speed is determined by if I'm using film, if I picked a 100 speed system, which would be an extremity cassette, or if I picked a 400 speed system, which would be a high speed cassette. In this case, I'm x-raying a chest x-ray, so I should have a high speed cassette. And what is the latitude? Is there too much gray? Is there too little gray? When you're looking at a chest x-ray, you want lots and lots of gray. So those are the film factors we're looking at. We're also looking at the processing. Has this film, if it went through a radiographic processor, has it processed for too long or was the temperature too high? So those are things we're looking at. We're looking at film characteristics. When we're looking at the geometric factors. We're seeing is there any distortion, magnification, and blur? And we're going to get to that when we're going through the rest of these slides. And then the subject factors are with the contrast, is the patient too large? Um, am I able to penetrate all of the parts of the x-ray with the density? And what is the atomic number of what I'm x-raying? Am I x-raying barium, which is a high atomic number? And has the patient moved? So that's all part of radiographic quality. But for the most part, when I'm looking at an x-ray, I'm making sure that the patient is in the middle of the image receptor. Now, the other thing I'm doing, and this is great for if I'm using a um, digital imaging system, I know that when I'm x-raying a patient for a chest x-ray, that I am gonna be centered at the apex of the scapula. Right here's the apex of the scapula. Now that really doesn't look like the center of my film, does it? It looks like that I've, I mean, everything looks beautiful on this x-ray, but if I had my crosshairs at the bottom of the apex of the scapula, then this should be the middle of the image receptor. And sometimes what I do is I just take a piece of paper and I make sure it's the size of my monitor and I fold that in half and then I put it next to this. And I can see that probably the middle of my film is going to be right about here. Now, what does that mean? That just means in this picture that I actually could have included more of the air-filled trachea on this patient. So I could have moved my image receptor down a little bit, and that way I would have a perfect x-ray. I want to be like the Picasso of x-ray. I want to have beautiful x-rays. And the only way you can do that is to make sure that you are doing everything you can to make sure it's a perfect image. So the very first thing I do when I'm x-raying a patient is I touch the body part where I'm supposed to have the central ray. So I would have my index finger on the patient's apex of the scapula. And then I would take my x-ray tube and I would bring it down and align my light to the apex of the scapula. Then I'm going to put the x-ray film chamber down to that area. After that, I finagle my way and I make sure that I'm not cutting the bottom of the patient's lungs off. And as you can see, I have lots and lots of room down here. So I could, for this particular patient, move that cassette up higher. Those are just little things you're doing when you're looking at the image quality. 
Um, if you take a look at any of my chest x-ray critiques, you're going to learn a lot more about chest imaging. But those are just a couple of things that I do. Now, I also have a pet peeve about x-ray markers. I think that this is a Picasso x-ray, so the x-ray marker should be parallel to the image receptor. It shouldn't be cockeyed like this. We want to have a beautiful x-ray. Um, and I also want to make sure that the person that x-rayed the patient, that their initials are on that particular image. And that would be a beautiful image for me. And that's just me. But when we're looking at optimal image quality and radiographic image quality, we want to take a look at some more factors that can give us a really nice image. And the characteristics that we're talking about are spatial resolution, contrast resolution, noise, and artifacts. So let's take a look at those parameters. The other thing that I do when I'm looking at my x-ray is I'm trying to determine how my image looks compared to spatial resolution. Spatial resolution is the ability to image small objects that have high subject contrast. So high subject contrast is going to be um, like if I'm x-raying an abdomen, there's lots and lots of viscera in there and there's lots of different grays that I can x-ray. So if I'm x-raying something such as a, a bone and a soft tissue interface, or a breast microcalcification or calcifications in a lung, I want to make sure that I have really good spatial resolution. Now, if we are using film screen combinations, they have excellent spatial resolution, which I would think it would be better with digital, but believe it or not, film screen combinations have the best spatial resolution. When we go to digital imaging, we can do more with post-processing in order to make things look great. So let's take a look at these images. The first image is a interoperative image of a patient that was in a procedure where they put a catheter up in the groin and then they place some x-ray contrast into that catheter. If I didn't have really nice spatial resolution, then I would not be able to determine where the vessel is located and if the contrast was slowing up that vessel. So that's why you have to have good spatial resolution. In the chest x-ray, unfortunately, this patient has a metastases from a brain tumor, but we can see all of the lung nodules because of nice spatial resolution. And that actually was a film that was taken on an x-ray of a patient. I know the one side's cut off, but it's just how that I, you know, copied it when I took a picture of that particular x-ray. And then the ones down below, that is showing microcalcifications in a breast. Now, the best way to do that would be to take the digital image and enlarge the digital image. But, if you don't have an imaging system that shows you the microcalcification, then you have nothing. So that's why it's good that in film, we can see the microcalcification and we definitely can see it in digital, but with digital, we can enhance it. If we had film, then the radiologist would have to take their uh, magnifying glass, clean it, and then they'd have to use a magnifying glass. So there are ways that we can improve on um, spatial resolution. We improve spatial re resolution with a reduction in screen blur, motion blur, and geometric blur. So let's take a look at those. Screen blur reduces when you have a very thin screen. X-rays interact with the entrance surface of the screen. If the screen is between the X-ray tube and the film, screen blur is a excessive. If the film is between the x-ray tube and the screen with the emulsion side toward the screen, spatial resolution is better. Back in the day when I used to perform mammography, we had cassettes that had one screen inside of them. If I had a cassette that had two screens, I would have more blur. 
more screen blur. So if you're using a cassette that has just one screen, that is going to decrease your screen blur as compared to a cassette that has two screens. Now, if I'm looking at the film up top, if I'm looking at the real bright and shiny part of the film, that is the part that does not have the emulsion. The emulsion actually dulls the film. So this part right here, the dull part, would be facing the intensifying screen. And that's going to reduce screen blur. If I had a double screen cassette, then I would have to have a dullness on both sides of my film. Both sides would look like that, okay? I know that's kind of difficult to understand, but when we were performing x-rays, even when I first started in x-ray school, we were using the single cassette where we only had one intensifying screen. Motion blur. Motion blur is movement of the patient or the x-ray tube during exposure resulting in blurring of the x-ray image. Now, believe it or not, sometimes your x-ray tubes can float if they're not indented and locked in place. They can move. So this loss of radiographic quality is called motion blur, and it may result in repeated radiographs and therefore should be avoided. But when you're x-raying kids and they're moving around quite a bit, sometimes it's hard to get rid of motion blur. Or if I'm x-raying a chest and the patient has a pacemaker and that pacemaker is pacing and the heart is beating, you're gonna see a little blurriness on the pacemaker lead. So patient motion is usually caused by motion blur. What you need to do is you need to have your patients stop breathing for exposures. Now, when I say stop breathing, if I'm taking a chest x-ray, take in a big breath and hold it, they stop breathing. If I'm x-raying in the abdomen, take in a big breath, blow it out, keep it out. Now, if I'm x-raying a neck, I'm just gonna say to the patient, stop breathing. Because they don't have to think if they're gonna breathe in or breathe out, they just stop. Because it really doesn't matter for a neck. It matters for a chest and abdomen. I'm also gonna make sure that when I can, I use a large source to image distance. Like for a cervical spine, I would use a 72 inch source to image distance because it's gonna give me less motion. And I'm gonna use a small um, object to image distance. I wanna have the patient's shoulder right up against that cassette. Now, in saying that, I'm not going to tilt the head toward the cassette because if I do that, I'm gonna have some distortion. But I wanna make sure that if I can, I make the OID as small as possible. Geometric blur is the sharpness of an image and it is a function of geometric factors. The three geometric factors that affect radiographic quality are magnification, distortion, and focal spot blur. So you wanna minimize the magnification by using a large source to image distance and a small object to image distance. You wanna minimize distortion by making certain that the object plane and the image plane are parallel. And the focal spot blur will be small on the anode side and large on the cathode side of the image. So take, effect, take advantage of the heel effect. With the heel effect, you wanna put the fat part of the patient underneath the cathode. So if you're x-raying a PA chest, you wanna put the abdomen under the cathode. For an abdomen, you wanna put the patient's entire abdomen under the cathode and the pelvis underneath the anode. For a femur, you wanna put the hip under the cathode, the knee under the anode. Humerus, you wanna put the shoulder under the cathode, the elbow under the anode. For a thoracic x-ray, you wanna put the abdomen under the cathode and the patient's neck under the anode. And for a lumbar spine, you wanna put the abdomen under the cathode and the pelvis under the anode. 
Here is a beautiful image. This actually was my x-ray of my patient, and I love this picture. So what is an artifact? It is an undesirable optical density that appears on the stream film radiograph. Artifacts occur during radiographic exposure and radiographic processing and when the film is being handled and stored before or after processing. So it can happen at any of those points. Now this is a wrist x-ray. What are these right here? What do you think those are? That is ice ice in a bag. So this patient came in, their wrist hurt. So in the ER, they put some ice in an ice pack, gave it to the patient, and the patient came over. But look at this. There's even ice up here. So there was no reason why we couldn't move this ice pack. In fact, we did for the, for the additional images. But you can see that this patient's wrist is really, really broken. So um, we had to take another one because the ER doc is going to have a hard time determining the extent of the fracture with the ice in the way. So ice is an artifact. Here are exposure artifacts. Now, exposure artifacts could be an unexpected foreign object such as jewelry. And we do that all the time. Isn't that awful? We go to a chest x-ray and we forget to take off the necklace. Got to take off the necklace. Double exposures, blur, grid cut off, obscured detail. What do you think about this first x-ray here? What do you think about that? That is actually a double exposure. How can I tell? Because there is an outline of a knee here. And then there's an outline of a knee here. So this was actually the AP knee and the oblique knee all taken together. So it's a double exposure. That's the first one. What do you think about the second x-ray? That one's pretty easy. This is an abdomen x-ray on a child. And the child picked his leg up. Here's his patella. And then here's his tibia and his fibula. So the child actually put their knee up during the x-ray. So that's an artifact. Sometimes they happen and you need to repeat. Here's a processing artifact. Processing artifacts could be guide shoe marks, pie lines, sharp increases or decreases in optical density. Uniform dull gray fog, dichronic stains, which are called curtain effect, small circular patterns of increased optical density, yellow brown drips on film, milky appearance, greasy appearance, brittle appearance. So, what do you think of this top x ray right here of this knee? What do you think happened there? Well, this patient had the x-ray, the x-ray was coming through the processor, and the person that was um, taking the x-ray grabbed the film because they wanted it quickly and they pulled it out of the processor. And these are scratches, scratches from the film being pulled out of the processor. That can actually happen. So you need to be careful when you're taking films out of the processor. The one up top, from a dirty roller. You see all this gunk right here in the roller? This is a roller inside your processor. All of our x-rays were coming out with this mark on it. And this mark corresponds to the dirtiness right there. So sometimes it's like you're a detective when you're taking x-rays, just like the bottom one. Now, if you look at the original pictures, you really, you see there's a spot. There's a spot right here, and there's a spot right here. And oh look, when we open up the cassette, there's a spot right there. So it was a dirty cassette. Once we went ahead and we cleaned that cassette, we got rid of that dirt, these images went away. 
So you got to be careful when you are looking at images. Or handling and storage artifacts. You could have light or X radiation that come onto your image's fog, pressure or kink marks, streaks of increased optical density, crown, tree, or smudge static, or yellow-brown stains. Okay, the top image. Let's go to the mammogram first. On a mammogram cassette, these old cassettes, we had clips. And these clips were right around here. And if that clip wasn't closed all the way, then guess what? You would have light showing up on your image. So that was a broken clip on a cassette, or it was a cassette that wasn't closed properly and you had that light leak. Just like the chest x-ray that you're seeing, right here is a clip and that clip was not closed correctly. And because that clip wasn't closed correctly, you see the black streak going up the cassette. So that's also because of a cassette that was not closed properly. Now the one on the bottom, it might be hard for you to see, the chest x-ray on the bottom, but you can see a little half-shaped moon right here. That's from bending the film inside the dark room. Now, if it comes out as white or black, it will tell you if it happened before or after x-ray process, excuse me, or before or after exposure. If you have a half-shaped moon that is white, that means that you crinkled the film in the dark room before you exposed it. If it is crinkled after exposure, it's going to show up just like this, a little black mark. So that just means that somebody creased or they took a fingernail and they dug into the film and that happens um, but it, you need to be careful when you're in the dark room so that that doesn't happen the other thing we need to do is we need to clean cassettes now you clean the film screen different than you clean the cassette for the entire cassette the very first cassette you see is a film screen cassette. The front and the black should be cleaned with a germicide wipe between imaging. Now in saying that, some germicide wipes you cannot use on all cassettes. We have cassettes at our hospital that we have to use a certain wipe. And the germicides are going to be in a purple container, a red container, a green container. Do not use the bleach wipes on these because it could leave a residue. Now, if you use it on the side of the cassette where the patient doesn't stand or put their hand, it's okay. You can use bleach on this side, that's okay. But be careful when you're using on the side where the patient puts their body part. You can use a germicide, but I would not put a Clorox wipe on there because it'll leave a residue. What we do is when we x-ray patients and we think there's gonna be blood or body fluid, we put these cassettes inside a plastic bag. If you don't have plastic bags, you can go ahead and use a chuck, or you could also use a pillowcase. If you use a towel, the towel may show up. But a chuck or, um, oh, what are those called? Yeah, I guess they are called chucks. I wouldn't use a diaper because the diaper may show up. Now the intensifying screen should be cleaned periodically in a busy x-ray department. Clean the screens once a month or more often and you have to write down the date that you clean them on a cleaning chart. The cleaning fluid used should be one that is recommended by the manufacturer of the cassette. So if I had a Fuji cassette, I would ask Fuji what I need to use. And then I use, need to use a soft, lint-free cloth so that I don't leave any spectacles inside the cassette. When I let the cassette dry, I want to put it standing up like a book. I don't want to put it face, face down because if I put it face down, the dirt will go right back in. 
So when I'm cleaning it, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put a little bit of fluid on this cloth. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to wipe the screen top to bottom being very gentle when I'm doing so and then after I do that I'm also going to clean this side too after I do that I'm going to let it stand for several minutes away from on um, an air duct because I don't want the air conditioning or the heat to come on and then the dust to go right back in here or I can even use this camel hair brush and with the camel hair brush, I can also brush out any debris out of that cassette. Now, CR systems or PSP systems are gonna be different. Once again, I'm gonna use a wipe that I am told to use that has a germicide on it. And then in my hospital, we have one person that cleans these because these are expensive you have to open up the cassette now this one's really easy to open all you have to do is just pop these hinges and you can open the cassette but some of these cassettes you actually have to have a little mechanism that will open it for you but this one's pretty easy act is pretty easy the person that cleans the cassette that is a psp cassette should remove the um plate from the cassette and ins inspect it weekly if you have an, a busy department. You want to use a lint-free cloth or a camel hair brush to remove dirt and dust. Use only solutions recommended by the manufacturer. Let's take a look at film fog. Now there are some causes. Film fog will increase with increased development time the longer you put your film in the developer solution, it will be darker. It will increase with increased developer temperature if the temperature of the developer is too hot. If you use the wrong filter in the dark room, remember an amber filter is for green sensitive films and a red filter is for blue and green sensitive films. If your dark room is too hot or humid, it can cause fog. If the door is not closed all the way, it can fog the film. If you have scatter radiation hitting your exposed film, it can contaminate and chemicals can contaminate your film if they're um, not poured properly into the replenishment system. One drop of fixer can contaminate your developer. Now, the picture you see in the middle is what I was doing for mammography. I would go in the dark room, I would put this cardboard on my film in the dark, and then I would turn on my safe light. My safe light would be on for five minutes. Then I would process the film. If the film came out with the word fog across it, and I was in there for five minutes, that's okay because at five minutes, I should have a little bit of fog. So what I did was I used a densitometer to check the levels on this mammography phantom. Now you're not gonna be doing that, but I wanted you to, to see that if you're in the dark room for five minutes and your film is laying there, it will show a little bit of fog on there. So you wanna get it processed. It should take you five seconds to process a film. It shouldn't take you five minutes. If it's taking you five minutes, then um, you're probably in there way too long. Now, when we're handling and storing film, we need to be careful. Radiographic film is sensitive to radiation and must be handled accordingly. Improper handling can cause artifacts. You need to protect film from heat and humidity. You wanna store it at temperatures lower than 20 degrees Celsius, which is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And you wanna store it in an area of low humidity, about 40 to 60% humidity. You wanna protect your film from the light. You wanna put it in a light proof storage bin located in a light tight dark room. And you wanna protect the film from radiation. Keep the exposed cassettes away from the x-ray tube. You wanna be careful before 
you start your procedure and then even when you're pulling your film out of the processor, you need to be careful in how you're touching that film. Now, digital is different. Digital is all what's going on inside the computer. It's all what's happening when you're placing the patient under the image receptor. There's something that's called moray. These are grid lines or image noise patterns that occur either when the alignment of the grid to the laser scan direction is incorrect or when spatial frequency is greater than the Nyquist frequency, which is a wrap around image will result. So when looking at these exposures, exposure A is an exposure that has a correctly positioned grid. The grid lines are perpendicular to the plate's reader scan lines. But in the second picture, you see a moray pattern caused by incorrectly oriented grid with the grid lines parallel to the plate's reader scan lines. I was working in the hospital one day and we x-rayed a patient and we saw grid lines all over the image and we're like, what the heck? Why are we getting these grid lines? Come to find out the room we were using, the x-ray Bucky does not reciprocate. And the reason it doesn't reciprocate is it is called a retrofit room used for fluoroscopy. And we don't want that Bucky to reciprocate. None of us knew. So anytime we x-rayed a patient in that Bucky, it was like a stationary Bucky. So after that, we couldn't x-ray anybody over 250 pounds. Because anybody over 250 pounds, you better have your grid reciprocating, otherwise you're gonna see grid lines. Who knew? So sometimes we find problems with our images because of doing a little bit of detective work. And then here's a ghost or phantom image. Now a ghost or phantom image is the appearance of ghost images occurs because of incomplete erasure of a previous image on a CR image protector or a PCP, excuse me, a PSP. Um, such artifacts can be corrected by additional signal erasure. So in looking at this x-ray, you see a beautiful chest x-ray, but there's a small bowel pattern over top of it. I really have never seen this happen. Well, the only time I saw this happen was when I was performing mammography, we had to x-ray um, a phantom like, I can't remember, maybe 15 times. And then we had to run it and we had to check the screen contact. Well. I didn't erase it, so when I went to x-ray a knee afterwards, I couldn't see the knee. You have to erase this thing about 15 times to get that phantom off of there. So sometimes if you, like let's say that you have, um, try this. Go into your room and take a, your lead marker and x-ray it like 50 times and then run it through the processor. And then take it back out and don't x-ray your marker, just x-ray the cassette. You'll probably see the marker still there because it hasn't totally erased. That's a ghost or a phantom image, something that hasn't completely erased. Kind of like my son has this TV and we kept telling him, we're like, honey, you cannot play that video game on that TV. And he said, oh, I love this game. I'm gonna go ahead and play it. Well, guess what? He now has that TV because it has burned an image into the screen. And this was one of the first digital TVs that we bought probably like in the early 2000s. That's the same thing. And finally, let's take a look at quantum model or noise. That is failure of an imaging system to record densities, usually by a lack of, lack of X-ray photons. When the exposure is too high or too low to produce an image, there is automatic rescaling occurring to display the pixels for the area of interest. 
a problem that occurs with rescaling with too little exposure is it results in a modeled appearance or when too much exposure is used resulting in a loss of contrast or a loss of, a loss of distinct edges because scatter is increased. If the MAS is low, then there are too little photons and the result will be lack of sufficient phosphor stimulation. When insufficient light is produced, the image is grainy. That is known as quantum model or quantum noise. All right, have a good day.